What I'm going to talk about here is the uh, product of uh, about a 10-year collaborative effort between the uh, surgeon and uh, our Department of Cardiology and uh, the University of Houston, trying to improve durability and success rate of mitral repair uh, through uh, better understanding of the engineering aspects of this basically, when it's all said and done, mechanical valve. Well, uh, in 1969, Dr. Carpentier introduced his famous uh, mitral valve repair, which was basically a, an anatomically based uh, rigid uh, ring put on over a resected leaflet where the prolapse had been. But as you can see here, that's the mitral annulus around the outside, and these are the two leaflets. And you see there is nothing static in this picture. So it's not surprising that uh, 30 years later, we now know that uh, the uh, Carpentier approach is beset with low repair rates. The national average in the United States is 60%, and overseas it's in the range of 50 to 60% in Europe, the United Kingdom, and even in Australia, which is a very advanced society. Uh, <laughs> the uh, long-term durability has proven to be very poor, 30% recurrence rate, so you take a 30 to 40% uh, inability to repair and combined with a 30% recurrence rate, and there are actually very few surgical procedures uh, that we consider doing with that kind of success rate. And the other big problem is this uh, phenomenon of systolic anterior motion, which is still a big problem uh, for people who do the Carpentier repair. What has happened since the onset of multiple imaging methods is that we've been able to see that the mitral valve is just part of a major uh, set of uh, elements that have to work together for the mitral valve to function properly. And these are called, instead of the mitral valve, we now talk about the mitral apparatus. And that consists of the left atrium, the mitral annulus, the mitral leaflets, the cordy, the papillary muscles, the left ventricle, and more recently we've added in the aortic root because of its remarkable contribution to mitral function. Uh, this is the anatomy of the mitral valve. Some of you were with us yesterday and saw this. This is the uh, Classic mitral annulus here. This is the attachment of the left atrial muscle. Uh, this is the uh, uh, aortic mitral continuity here. Uh, there's a little fibrous triangle here. And this is the left coronary leaflet and the non coronary leaflet. And you can see this is one big continuous membrane from this point down. And behind here is the left ventricular outflow tract going up through the aortic valve. So what we see anatomically as we dissect is a uh, aortic root this little fibrous triangle, the aortic mitral continuity, the attachment of the left atrium, and the anterior mitral leaflet. And this is where you get this D-shape that Dr. Carpentier modeled his uh, annuloplasty ring, because it, when you look in the left atrium, that's what you see because of the attachment of the left atrial muscle. With 3D and annular tracking, all of a sudden, we're seeing something quite a bit different. We're seeing a mitral annulus going up to the aortic annulus up here. Uh, and we don't see a D. The D here is across here, but this whole area moves as one membrane. So we now start to think about the anterior leaflet and a mitral membrane here rather than a D-shaped structure. The mitral valve uh, is a uh, very important structure both uh, as a uh, valvular thing and as a definer of the left ventricular outflow tract. In systole, the anterior leaflet comes forward, comes backwards here and into apposition with the posterior leaflet, creating left ventricular outflow tract, and diastole it moves forward and creates the left ventricular inflow tract. It's interesting to note that anatomically, the entire mitral apparatus is totally in the posterior half of the left ventricle. If you draw a line through the long axis of the LV, the posterior leaflet, anterior leaflet, papillary muscles, and cordia are all in the posterior half of the left ventricle. So in this ends up stuck on the septum during systole, you have really created a big problem because that's a huge uh, uh, abnormality to create. So normally in systole, uh, the leaflets come together at the end of diastole. They, uh, then as the heart contracts, the annulus gets smaller, the leaflets roll into each other more, progressively coming into greater and greater apposition or coaptation. The long axis of the left ventricle gets shorter and the left ventricular cavity gets smaller. So ultimately, at peak systole, we have a small annulus, about 20% smaller than uh, it was at the start of systole. We have these leaflets in close apposition, and the edges of the leaflets uh, through the cordia and the papillary muscles are pulled down towards the apex by about one and a half centimeters. 
So if we look at what's happening from an engineering point of view in terms of what this uh, increasing cohabitation service is doing, we can go across those same three panels we just looked at uh, now in an engineering manner, and we can look at stress down here versus cohabitation and what's happening to the cording. And what we see is the annulus is getting smaller, the cohabitation is getting bigger, and the cohabitation service is enlarging. And as the cohabitation service is enlarging, the low stress that was initially taken by the little fine marginal cordy is now being transmitted onto the very big strong strut cordy. And then finally, everything's being transmitted over to the annulus at maximum cohabitation. So the effect of cohabitation is to unload the cordy, which are the weakest part of the mitral valve, and transmit the stress through to the annulus. Basically what's happening is when you push your hands together really hard, that becomes one membrane. So essentially at peak systole, you've got a drum head up there. You don't have two leaflets. You have one leaflet attached around the annulus. And that's the strongest part, and that's uh, what allows mitral valves to have great durability. The uh, cordy themselves are relatively weak structures. So if we look at a dilated annulus, you can see what a catastrophe this is because it peels back the zone of coaptation and in systole everything's loaded up. So one of the important parts in the pathogenesis of mitral regurgitation is when you lose your zone of coaptation for some reason, you start busting cordy because the cordy now are taking the load at peak systole instead of the zone of coaptation and the annulus. On the other hand, we never uh, have much of a problem in mitral stenosis because the leaflets are glued together and the coaptation zone is massive and stress distribution is outstanding. But unfortunately, the orifice is still a problem. So we've been doing a lot of studies here on uh, stress analysis because when we repair these valves, we're taking very badly diseased valves. Fortunately, the engineering studies show that the leaflets, although they're very elastic, they're stretchy, they actually have very strong material uh, uh, properties. So they're stretchy, but they don't break. That's why you never see someone come in with a busted leaflet. They don't have holes in their leaflets unless they had endocarditis or something. On the other hand, cordy lose about 90% of their strength with myxomatous degeneration. So when we repair a mitral valve, uh, we're leaving in cordy that aren't busted, but are which are weakened by 90%. So to overcome that, our theory was 10 years ago, we had to work hard to maximize the reduction in stress on these components. So we've been studying at length, uh, both here and at the University of Houston, uh, stress distribution. And this is what a normal valve looks like. You can see there's some stress along the uh, zone of apposition. There's very little stress around the annulus. There's stress at the uh, commissures. Very little stress on the leaflets because of this zone of apposition and all this nice distribution of stress. And here you can see in, uh, I'm sorry, we're talking about strain here. Uh, here you can see in a dilated uh, valve with the annulus dilated that we have uh, a lot of strain around the uh, leaflets themselves, uh, widely distributed around the annulus, and a lot of strain scattered here through the bodies of the leaflets, and even bigger strain at the commissures. Here you can see a patient preoperatively a uh, lot of strain everywhere. Brown is strain, uh, widely distributed around the uh, edges of the leaflets and onto the leaflets themselves. And here you see post-op uh, restoration of normal strain. And what we've been able to do using the techniques we're going to show you is reduce strain in some patients to a level below normal. And we believe that has contributed to the significant improvement in durability we've been able to achieve. On the other hand, uh, if we look at a, a mathematical model of the Carpentier repair, which is a flat, rigid ring and trimmed down leaflets, which makes them flat, there's no billowing or curvature to them, we see an incredibly highly stressed uh, repair. And Dr. Carpentier himself has reported on his findings at operation uh, in his patients, and it, they're all to do with things coming apart, tearing apart, or calcifying under stress. This is a simulation of uh, the uh, curved annulus, three-dimensional annulus, and three-dimensional leaflets. And there's no, almost no stress at all. This is the attachment points of the uh, strut cordy. So Dr. Little here uh, did studies on the behavior of the mitral annulus. Uh, here at end diastole, it's uh, got uh, its uh, large area. And here at end systole, it has a small area. You can see this 1.5 centimeter movement downwards during systole, and the area change is usually around 25 to 30 percent. 
we know for a number of years that the uh, annulus has a uh, three-dimensional structure. It's been likened to a saddle. This shape of the saddle here we now know corresponds to the uh, attachment of the membrane here to the aortic root. So this shape is basically contour conferred by this shape, and you can see this three-dimensional shape here. And in systole, as the aorta expands and rotates, it pushes this point upwards and uh, backwards. So the saddle, and in an anterior posterior fashion, goes like that and brings the anterior leaflet closer to the posterior leaflet. We see this thanks to our TAVI colleagues. A lot of CTAs have been done. And uh, uh, you can see here in systole, the aortic root has expanded by 12 to 14% below the level of the annulus. And that's pushing back into the uh, left atrium. That's the anterior part of the mitral annulus. And that makes a nice big outflow tract while the uh, mitral valve is closed. And then in uh, diastole, uh, the uh, exact opposite happens. The root is relaxed. The uh, uh, anterior part of the uh, mitral annulus moves forward, and we now have the maximum left, uh, inflow into the left atrium, the maximum area of the mitral annulus. Here you can see the actual, this is an actual from a patient from Siemens. Uh, with a grid, which is a quantitative grid, and you can see here the aortic root, and you'll notice this rocking motion of the aorta. It's going like that, and if you look closely through the aortic mitral continuity here, this is actually rocking the anterior part of the mitral annulus of the anterior leaflet backwards into the left atrium. So this rocking motion you're seeing is lifting up and moving the uh, anterior leaflet back towards the posterior leaflet. So this is a remarkable participation of the aortic root in this whole process that we hadn't fully appreciated up to about uh, seven or eight years ago. And you can see the leaflets opening and closing, and you can see this expansion. If you look closer, you can see this 12% expansion of the aortic root itself. Uh, this has been quantified recently. This was a very nice paper from Dr. Veronese in Chicago, and he showed that these uh, dimensional changes, uh, here's where the uh, uh, aortic root is attached down through the aortic mitral continu continuity to the anterior leaflet, and this is the part that's moving upwards and backwards in systole. As the aorta is being pushed out of the heart, it rotates more horizontally, and that rocking down here, down this way, pushes this point up and back, and it has the dual effect of bringing the anterior leaflet more towards the posterior leaflet and moving the anterior leaflet bodily out of the left ventricular outflow tract. And these move movements are about 8 to 10 millimeters in magnitude, so they're quite significant. I mean, if we look here at a, uh, an MRI, you can see the aorta, left atrium, left ventricle. We can see the anterior mitral leaflet here being pushed up and back. And as that's happening, you can see this rocking of the aorta into a more horizontal position. You can see the aortic valve moving up and out from the heart a little bit. And if you look down here, we can see all of the uh, cordy and papillary muscles in the posterior half of the left ventricle. And this mechanism has a strange effect of allowing the left ventricular outflow tract to expand and get bigger while the entire rest of the heart is getting smaller. So this mechanism is very important for preserving the left ventricular outflow tract. So why then is SAM still a problem in 2000? Well, now up to 2016. It's not a problem for us, but it is for a lot of other people. And these are from uh, leading centers, David Adams in New York, Larry Cohn, the late Larry Cohn, unfortunately, in, uh, in Boston. And uh, as recently as a few years ago, they were still publishing papers on how to deal with uh, SAM. So it's not a trivial thing because uh, these people can get into a lot of trouble. They get uh, hemodynamic instability. You give them inotropes, everything gets worse. You may have to go in and revise the repair. Uh, you may have to end up doing a mitral valve replacement. So this is a very serious thing when it happens. And the other biggest problem is people have started whittling away at the leaflets. They've had a misconception as to the etiology. And we've got all sorts of complex maneuvers people are doing uh, to try to get rid of this thing because they're using the wrong approach. The D-shaped annulus is fundamentally the problem. This is a, a CAT scan from a paper just this year on how to better measure a D so they can develop a device to simulate Dr. Carpentier, which is a kind of a disaster when you think about it. There's the aortic root, there's the D-shape, that's the actual shape of the annulus, more or less circular, going up to that point there. And you can see here very clearly in the outflow track, if you put something in at that level, instead of being up here where you should be, you're down halfway down the anterior leaflet. 
And the effect of that was actually uh, published in 2009 by Dr. Kaimi using MRI. And what he showed that this creates mitral stenosis because the leaflet can't move away in diastole and it produces left ventricular outflow tract obstruction because the leaflet's pushed into the left ventricular outflow tract during systole. So the traditional Carpentier ring is going to look like this, right uh, left fibrous trigone to right fibrous trigone, putting a bar right across where you want the outflow tract to expand. Instead of doing that, you've stuck something here and it can only do that. So uh, one of the technical modifications we've made is to bring our uh, ring all the way up here under the aortic valve. And it's been a key element. And we've studied this in a number of different ways. This is just one slide showing how we've been able to preserve. Uh, we, this is the Carpentier is in red and we're in black. Uh, Carpentier technique right through the cardiac cycle, no change using our technique. There's the uh, reduction in the area during systole and there's the increase in the area in diastole. <clears throat> we've done very sophisticated mathematical uh, modeling uh, with Dr. Azencott at the University of Houston using uh, novel mathematical uh, methods. And you can see a normal, a big dilated, flattened out uh, uh, patient uh, with MR, and then post-op we've got this. These are from actual 3D echo tapes that we've provided to him. Uh, uh, earlier this year, we reported on 100% repairability in a series of 752 consecutive patients. This uh, paper's on your uh, website, a PDF. Uh, using these techniques, so we're very pleased with the outcome of that. And basically, just to show you what we do, here's a huge anterior leaflet. Uh, we use artificial cordy, which we place in the papillary muscle. These are the leaflets. We bring the cordy up through the free edge of the leaflet. And then the critical part is the recognition uh, that we, number one, have to have a fully flexible ring to allow all these movements to continue to occur. And then number two, we have to get everything uh, properly aligned. And you've seen there are many moving parts here. And you can't just have a heart collapsed flat on its back, paralyzed in front of you, and expect to be able to eyeball putting all these things back together correctly. <coughs> so after some years of searching, we came upon diastolic locking, which is the phenomenon that we all have physiologically, which brings the mitral leaflets together right at the end of diastole at maximum left ventricular filling. And this is to prevent early systolic mitral regurgitation. This is a normal phenomenon and can be simulated in the OR with a collapsed heart by simply blowing the heart up. So we blow the heart up with a four liters per minute uh, insufflator with a little electric pump. And we're able to simulate this uh, diastolic locking, which you can see here being simulated. The leaflets initially come up and then as we continue to inflate, you'll suddenly see instead of billowing up, they all go down and inwards, which is the configuration of systole you saw in our earlier panels. And that is the point of mitral locking, and that's proven to be a very accurate way of simulating everything we need to know about the dimensions of the heart at the point of repair. And here you can see that anterior leaflet repaired, the cordy going down, nice zone of apposition, and a wide open left ventricular outflow tract. That was a huge leaflet, and we have no SAM, no left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. <coughs> and this is what we see intraoperatively. Here's a post repair uh, with its ring on, and you can see the aortic root back in here, left coronary sinus, non coronary sinus. And you can see the uh, annulus moving very freely here up and back into the left ventricular outflow tract. And if you look at this panel here, it's a little hard to see, but it's very hard to film this. The aorta is up here, uh, mitral annulus here, anterior leaflet. And as we're inflating, you can see this uh, aortic root uh, increasing in size and the aorta trying to come out of the heart. And everything's rolling over, pushing the anterior part of the annulus towards the posterior part of the annulus. And you look at that, and you look at that, and you can see it's a pretty good simulation. Well, Steve's uh, talked at length about uh, papillary muscle traction and how different uh, Barlow's is from other conditions, and this is a widely misunderstood condition too. You can see the papillary muscles being pulled up 50, and the reason we mentioned the annulus is this is a 55 millimeter annulus, and here post-op, we have now a valve that's completely competent. The leaflets are down in the ventricle, and the papillary muscles no longer are being pulled up, and the uh, papillary muscles are moving down to the apex. And the only difference between this picture and this picture is that the annulus here is 55 millimeters and the annulus here is 37 millimeters. 
So the annulus has a critical integral role to play in the uh, correction of mitral regurgitation and it's largely overlooked by most surgeons. Uh, this is another little thing. This is a four-page editorial in, the, in your uh, book there. There's a, uh, a PDF. And this is a summary, which I think is a pretty good summary on this topic. I mean, getting influenced by Donald Trump to use superlatives about everything I do now. I, I used to not do that, but it looks like he's winning. <laughs> so the other little topic just... Uh, uh, is that we've tended to overlook the tricuspid valve. And when we're following people along, they get a little TR and you say, yeah, well, that's expected. They've got a little TR, that's part of the package. And in fact, once you see TR developing these people, it's really critical to step back and go back to square one, have a really good look at things and wonder why they're getting TR. Not to sit on the patient and try to treat that TR medically until the people come in with ascites and swollen legs as they so often do. So we've got a much more aggressive posture to TR, and if they have an annulus that's more than 40 millimeters and moderate TR, we, we're just repairing the TR at the time of surgery, but we hope people will get to us before that. So the onset of TR is a landmark in the patient's natural history that should not be overlooked. Well, this is my personal experience of surgery on the mitral valve uh, over the last uh, few years. And uh, we're now coming up on 1900 mitral valve repairs using these techniques. And uh, uh, 2015, we presented this work at the uh, uh, STS. And uh, what we were able to show is for the last 10 years, we've had 100% repairability in the most common uh, pathological etiology, conditions where the leaflets are destroyed, obviously, are much more difficult to repair. And the reoperation rate at the 10 uh, year mark has been less uh, than 10%, 7%. Uh, all the conditions can be treated equally well, anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet, they're all identical. So we've got very high freedom from reoperation. We've got 90% uh, freedom from moderate or more mitral regurgitation. And interestingly, uh, we've been able to re-repair 80% of the people that get a recurrence. So we've been able to re-repair them. <clears throat> so when you combine 100% repairability with 80% re-repairability, you get the remarkable finding that at 10 years, our population of people who came to us in the beginning have a 99% freedom from a prosthetic valve. So this is a very important consideration, the fact we can keep people away from prosthetic valves. Now, uh, there'll be a lot of discussion about the mitra clip. From my point of view, uh, I think this has been a remarkable advance and it's have, have extremely useful in uh, certain very important populations, but it is still uh, primarily a palliative uh, therapy. And the uh, palliation it produces is extremely good in many people. We've had some outstanding results, but it is important to recognize a couple of Things that I'm just going to quickly emphasize is just someone who's sort of on the receiving end of this uh, uh, therapy, not on the giving end. It is more blessed to give than to receive in some cases. There's no question about that. Uh, basically, in the early days when we just had people uh, doing one clip, they'd go to the lab, they'd spend five hours putting one clip on, and it didn't work. We get a call, we take them down, and 80, 90 percent of those people could be repaired. What has happened is that uh, the standard is probably, what, pretty much two clips now for most people. And as the number of clips increases, the chances of a reoperation become, re uh, uh, repair become remote. So when you're talking to your uh, patients about uh, the clip, they need to understand that the likelihood is that if the clip is unsuccessful, they will be getting a prosthetic valve. They, they, the conversation, well, we'll try the clip, if that doesn't work, we'll repair, and you haven't lost anything, is no longer valid. By and large, they will be getting a prosthetic valve. So that's just something to consider when you're talking to them. <coughs> the other issue is, uh, uh, this is just a recent paper from uh, Saraja from the uh, commercial MitraClip uh, registry that just came out in Jack, and it shows pretty much what we normally see uh, 30, 40 percent of people have grade uh, two uh, or more mitral regurgitation. Well, uh, and at some point, I think it'd be, I don't know whether you had the discussion yesterday, but at some point, the quantification of MR after uh, mitral clip, I guess, is still a problem or? 
So we're all in the same boat as far as when they've got uh, somewhat unusual configurations what the actual severity of the MR is. We know from our follow-up studies, which include quite a few people uh, before we refined our techniques, that the vast majority of people uh, after mitral valve repair leave the hospital with either mild uh, MR or uh, at most two to three percent have uh, moderate to severe or severe MR. And over a long period of time, certainly over the 10, 15 year time frame, 20 percent develop up to moderate MR. And this is a topic we need to study carefully too because we're not really sure what the impact is. But it is interesting again just this year there was a paper from Dr. Alfieri's group himself regarding the uh, issue of the impact of 2 plus residual mitral regurgitation on the survival, clinical course, and uh, effect on the ventricle of this residual MR. And what they showed, it was quite a strong impact on uh, survival from 2 plus MR in its population. And in fact, uh, 2 plus MR uh, had a tremendous dominance as a risk factor for death. So this is something that needs to be looked at in more detail with the mitra clip, and we certainly need to look at it in more detail in our small population of people that have greater than 2 plus MR uh, after uh, regular repair. Now finally, when you're in your office and you see a patient and you're looking uh, to see whether maybe they be a bit tough to do a repair on, but maybe we can send them for a mitra clip, <coughs> uh, sometimes, and certainly up until recent years when we've, uh, the TABI uh, experiences educate us better about the issue of frailty uh, and what to do with the older people that may not be suitable for surgery. Our experience has been in selected people in their 70s and 80s that the mortality has been extremely low. So mitral valve repair in selected elderly people who are healthy, and we see a lot of them in this part of the country because we've got all these farmers and guys out on their ranches who are 80, 85 still bailing, hey, these people do just great with regular surgery. So I'm just asking that you don't automatically triage your patients on the basis of age alone. There are plenty of 80-year-olds that are train wrecks that we wouldn't consider for surgery and who benefit greatly from the clip, but there are also quite a few people who uh, uh, do very well with uh, surgery in that age group. Uh, we've got a website, Gerald Laurie, MD, there are videos and other materials there if you want to pursue things further. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I'm glad you're all here this morning.